So going back to uh, then the end of the Middle Ages, we've got a consensus of Catholic doctrine, but we need to see then uh, the beginning of the, uh, the reformers themselves. They, as I said, the reformers didn't come from nowhere. They had a background, they came from a particular context. All of the reformers, uh, pretty much that I can think of, were all Catholic priests. Luther, Zwingli, um, Cranmer, uh, they, they were all Catholic priests. So they were all trained in philosophy and theology in Catholic universities, either Erfurt or Tübingen or, or uh, Leipzig or, or uh, in, in Cranmer's case, Cambridge. Not, uh, we need to start with Luther um, to begin with. Luther, again, didn't come from nowhere. The road to the Reformation had been paved for several centuries. And there were two major inputs. Most people assume that the biggest influences on Luther was his reaction to the corruptions going on in the church the abuse of indulgences and you know a century before him there were you know the Avignon papacy and the great western schism and the three popes and all of that all of that did its damage there's no doubt about that and it 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 paved the way to really um damage the credibility of the magisterium and church authorities in the eyes of the people no doubt uh, about that but that's not the only influence on luther and the philosophical influence is just as important. Now, something called nominalism, and I'm not going to go into detail on, on that, but you'll find it in the other video on, on substance. Uh, it, it's a denial of abstract um, uh, ideas, uh, and you, what's, what's called universals or abstract ideas. And fundamentally, the way it manifested itself throughout um, the preceding centuries, because Luther didn't invent nominalism. It came from a guy called uh, Rosslyn, and uh, then um, his disciple uh, Peter Abelard, and then popularised by Franciscan, English Franciscan, called William of Ockham. Um, and it, it was around for 200 years, really, before Luther. But the, uh, the real marked principle of nominalism was a distrust of any kind of authority. Everything has to go uh, down to particular experiences because there's, um, there's, there's nothing, there's no abstract realities. Even the church authority boils down to oral tradition and scripture. So the church authority, the magisterium, isn't really a real thing. It's just, uh, it's just a name, which is what nominalism is. Um, and that had just as uh, much of an important impact on Luther as, uh, as the politics that were going on. If you don't understand nominalism, you won't really understand uh, the influence of some of the later reformers as well. Cranmer was clearly a nominalist. He was trained in nominalism in Cambridge. Uh, and as I say, uh, the, the professors that taught um, Luther, uh, Truffetta and uh, Arnoldi, uh, were very much uh, advocates of this idea of don't trust authority. It's it's uh, personal experience and scripture. And the Catholic nominalists, although they were very, very misguided on that, at least did have respect for some oral tradition, even though uh, Ockham was actually uh, b uh, brought himself into serious conflict with the papacy in the 14th century. Uh, but uh, the effect... It's, it's very clear, and some people dispute whether Luther was a nominalist. He was. He says so himself, that he has uh, uh, accepted Ockham. And although he rejects uh, Aristotelianism, there is no um, evidence and no real argument that he would, uh, we can suggest that he rejected nominalism. Um, but nominalism, if you don't believe in abstract ideas or universals, and again, if you don't understand what I mean, you won't understand this next section, really. Um, you won't understand the church as an abstract reality with an essence that defines it and not just a collection of individual people in communion with each other. And the Catholic understanding of the church is a timeless abstract reality with an essence that's defined by God himself, the body of Christ. And the authority 
that uh, is manifest in the church with the priests and bishops therefore is essential to the nature it cannot change over time it's got nothing to do with fashions or facts it's a timeless abstract essence that uh, exists in the church so the church is is um, ruled by um, the episcopacy in, in terms of defining doctrine and safeguarding doctrine and and the, the pope as the, um, uh, the the steward of the kingdom Luther's nominalism, and we can see nominalism, once we understand what we're looking for, we can see it throughout his thought. Um, he gets rid of that idea of the church. Christ is up in heaven somewhere. There is no such thing as an abstract reality called the church. It's just all of these people here. And that means they can be wrong and there is no magisterium. So in Luther's terms, and it's very clear, and Cramer definitely shares this judgment as well, bishops and priests there's no change uh, ontological change or change of being no character on the soul they're not set apart they're just commissioned they're just uh, educated and commissioned to do a function which is completely different from the catholic idea and we see a timeline of luther's journey from uh, studying o o and uh, true fetter study studying in Erfurt in the nominalist tradition and also, uh, you know, his, his experiences with seeing corruption in Rome and his own uh, problems, his own tension within himself, which we'll get to in a, in a minute. But he gets to um, this point where the, the 95 Theses tradition suggests that he hammered them on the, the door of the University Church at Wittenberg, where he was um, a professor at the time. Uh, against indulgences uh, by and large but then um, he, he within three years he pretty much denied most of Catholic doctrine and he ended up with having debates um, between uh, various different you know, uh, Cajetan uh, um, and uh, Johann Eck uh, Catholic apologists and his writing in 1520 was condemned uh, by Pope Leo the the tenth and by um, <clears throat> well, the end of 1520, he had uh, written the Babylonian captivity, which is absolutely lays out his his story very very clearly, and he's just left Catholic doctrine well behind by that time. So, with all that background uh, that we've seen, with uh, the historical and philosophical inputs into Luther's life, <clears throat> we can start really examining. Uh, the man himself, uh, what uh, Luther himself would describe as his anwechtung, his angst, his despair of his own worthiness of salvation, and trying to fit that in with uh, Catholic doctrine of justification, um, how that uh, we, uh, his understanding of the Catholic system was uh, we earn our salvation through good works, at least with cooperation from God and uh, there is uh, an element, a very important element of uh, cooperation. St. James himself says uh, faith without works is dead and that's fundamental. Anybody who, who says that the Catholic point of view is unbiblical is just extraordinary. Um, but it, it's, it's a, com a complex uh, medley of different uh, causes in Luther. It's not just one thing. Uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, stage of development of his his own life and his his doctrines, but he gets um, to this point where he concludes that uh, good works are useless for justification, and if the mass is a work, a cooperation uh, with with God, then <clears throat> that's actually, in his estimation, a heresy. the The mass is pure gift; it's not a sacrifice that uh, we offer for the living and the dead and this is key because the Catholic doctrine is very much the Mass is a sacrifice that we offer for the living and dead. We cooperate with Christ. The priest uh, acts in the person of Christ to cooperate with God's work to make the sacrifice accessible for us so that we can receive his body and blood. This is what he's fundamentally attacking and it comes as I say from his theology of, of justification really. Uh, <clears throat> his own unworthiness, that faith alone, scripture alone, is uh, really the, the source of faith. And uh, justification is really God's uh, s attributing uh, justice to us. He's stamped our file uh, saying that person is justified through through faith. Whereas, um, as I say, the, the offering mass and, and our cooperation with 
uh, God through uh, good works is central to Catholic Christianity. And we say, see, we mentioned this before uh, when we were uh, discussing John chapter 6, the bread discourse. Uh, Luther dismisses it as having anything to do with the Eucharist. It's, uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary because it's so clearly Eucharistic. But uh, even though he, <clears throat> he doesn't go on to dispute the real presence, uh, he, he just can't see it as being connected with the spiritual eating um, of, of the body and blood of, of Christ. It's, it's uh, a remarkable passage in his book. It's all from the Babylonian captivity. So he said, we you know, re receive the mass, that we offer a sacrifice. So he can't, uh, he can't get a, you know, agreement on that, obviously. Um, said this, um, alluded to it in the past when we were talking about authority. He lays the blame for a lot of the doctrines that he goes on to reject, specifically on the Eucharist and on justification, but we'll stick to the Eucharist for the purposes of this video, of course, and lays that blame on the papacy uh, as a corruption. And a lot of the reformers saw the papacy, especially in the High Middle Ages after Gregory the Seventh and especially Innocent the Third, as, as being a corrupt institution which has distorted the teachings of Christ and essentially invented these doctrines and forced them on the Christian Church. Uh, and one of his the biggest weaknesses in that argument, and not just Luther, but all of those who held that position, is that you can see that all of these doctrines of the sacrifice of the mass, priests, vestments, all the things that the theologians um, of the, the, the Reformation threw out, are all ubiquitous in the communities that have been founded on apostolic lines. It's got nothing to do with Rome uh, forcing anything. Uh, and that's just a matter of historical fact. It's an, a real Achilles heel in Luther's argument. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> the East had been separated from Rome uh, since uh, the 11th century, although with various different approchements, uh, and they all developed um, these, uh, these very, very clearly sacrificial understandings of the liturgy from their earliest times, really from the, the ages of the Church Fathers. So it, it makes no sense, really. Um, it's an extraordinary allegation of Luther, and it's just, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Comparing uh, the Catholic understanding, again, just revising and clarifying in case there's anything that needs to be reinforced here. Uh, in the Catholic interpretation, the Mass is a sacrifice, uh, and that, that um, the flesh of Christ is represented for us to consume in a ritual meal, just as the, the lamb's flesh at the Passover would have been sacrificed and uh, eaten by the family who, who offered it in, uh, uh, in the Passover meal. And that, therefore, is applied, the uh, efficacy of the fruits of the sacrifice are applied to uh, the intention of the living and the dead. There are three components of sacrifice, priest, altar, and victim. You need all three to have a sacrifice. You need a priest, one who offers it. You need something to sacrifice on, which is an altar, and a victim. And again, anamnesis, bringing present, a past event into uh, the present. And those who, um, who for whom the, uh, the mass is offered, uh, benefit for it for for their salvation and uh, Aquinas then uh, gives a very comprehensive um, response and uh, comparing Luther's understanding of who we are and what we are uh, and uh, the, the Catholic with, with the Catholic doctrine uh, again it's it's cooperation with, with with us it's a conversion the Eucharist is meant to convert us to change us into the Eucharist, essentially, which is, is, is Christ, to, to divinize us, which is something we see in St. Augustine. Uh, we are broken because of original sin. Baptism reawakens something in our soul, and uh, through the sacraments, we are converted and nourished by, uh, by the Eucharist. We are changed at the level of being, at the level of ontology, which is another, it's a posh word uh, to mean the same thing. <clears throat> Luther um, doesn't see it like that at all. As, as I said, we, uh, he sees justification as a proclamation of God that that person is, is justified through, through faith. So there's no cooperation, really. There's a predestination. 
that that person, uh, God has decided that they will be saved. And, and it's purely the work of God and not a cooperation. So two very, very different uh, levels of understanding there, which does impact, as I say, his Eucharistic theology as to what the Mass is and what it's for at the end of the day. So if he doesn't believe in good works, if the Mass is a good works that is offered to God for atonement, then obviously he throws it out of the window. And it's, it's as simple as that. So let's have a look at what the Eucharist means for Luther. And as I, we're not inventing anything here. We're using his own writings here, which are, as I say, accessible. The Babylonian uh, captivity is where he lays out his, his position. Uh, so to, to, to Luther, to summarise, uh, if the Mass isn't a sacrifice, what is it? What's going on there? So to Luther, uh, the, the sacrifice has already happened 2,000 years ago. So the Last Supper was uh, a last will and testament of Christ, through which he tells the apostles it's a promise as to the salvation that awaits them. That's all it is. He does believe in a real presence. He does believe um, that Christ is present in the Eucharist, but he rejects transubstantiation. He rejects a change of the substance of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. The crucifixion is a past event, so we're not bringing anything into the present in that respect. It literally is a memorial, looking back at the past. Uh, <clears throat> it is a fraternal meal, uh, if you like, commemorating a promise that, uh, that Christ uh, gave at the, the Last Supper, um, and that he, he comes into pr uh, our presence uh, in a, a manner of fellowship, um, but, it, but that's, uh, it, it's not efficacious, uh, there doesn't need to be vestments or anything like that. He was very careful how, how he uh, instigated that. There's, there's an absolute categorical clear uh, repudiation of sacrificial theology there. Before we move on to what Luther then and the reformers did to the liturgy, we have to uh, appreciate this really important concept in Catholic theology, the link between what we pray and the words we use in our liturgy and what we believe. So it's um, is it something uh, that, that um, a fifth century theologian came up with, uh, lex credendi, lex randi. And actually there's like a third component of that, lex vivendi. So um, the, the way that we live, the way that we pray, i.e. the words that we use, are in complete coherence with what we believe. So we shouldn't be living in a way that's in, contradict uh, in contradiction with what we believe. Uh, and the words that we use in the Missal, for example, should clearly and unambiguously reflect the sacrificial and sacramental theology that we believe is being enacted as we say those words. So it's very careful for the words that we use in our prayers to be unambiguous and to reflect Catholic theology. Because Luther rejects uh, the sacrificial theology of the Mass. He criticises the parts of the, the Roman canon specifically, which was permeated throughout Europe. We, we'll see that in a minute. In a minute. Um, but uh, he, he rejects those prayers and those parts of the Missal, which make it very clear that the Mass is a sacrifice. And he said that those, those should essentially uh, come out. And anything that makes it look like a, sacri a sacrifice should also be removed as well. And so his, um, uh, his liturgy that he, uh, he borrows a lot from uh, the Roman rite, but he, he takes things out and changes the order of things in order, and there's no doubt about this whatsoever, his entire idea is to expunge sacrificial Catholic theology from the liturgy, but do it in such a way that's not going to be a massive shock to the people. So present them with something that seems to be relatively familiar, but take the theology out of it, the Catholic theology out of it. And that's essentially exactly what he does. And that, that's the plan behind uh, the liturgy. And this is the same then um, basic principle that the later reformers, especially when we come to, to England with the Book of Common Prayer, it's exactly the same uh, principle that they employ in England, uh, Cranmer specifically. Let's have a look at more detail about consubstantiation. Uh, so, in this case, Luther is saying that 
Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. But what he's saying is that the bread and wine don't cease to exist. So Christ is kind of spiritually infuses himself uh, in, in the bread and wine. So L Luther's point can be sum summed up as he's putting words in Christ's mouth, this bread is my body and this wine is my blood. That's essentially his point, um, that there is some kind of uh, fusion there, but it's not a change of substance. And he uses, I'm not gonna go into the gra grammatical um, uh, argument, he's saying that the Greek and the Latin don't reflect what Christ actually meant to say. Well, the scripture is written in Greek, and it's therefore that's clearly the interpretation the evangelists had of what Christ was doing. So if you're not going to believe them, it, it's, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary argument, uh, which just, as Henry VIII's uh, um, book we'll have a look at in a minute points out, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, but, but that's essentially what he's saying. Uh, so consubstantiation, meaning that the substance of bread and the substance of Christ somehow coexists. Um, and he says, for some reason, that's more scriptural than, um, or, or more in coherence with tradition even. Um, not that he's really, he doesn't, because of his nominalist background, he doesn't really care about tradition, quite frankly. It's, it's, that's his, the, the big thing is his source of authority, um, that, that it's, it's scripture and it's his interpretation of scripture that is more important. And that's not coming from anywhere, that's coming from nominalism and um, the background with Wycliffe and Huss. Uh, as well. All of that is coming into play. So he, actually it, it, he's not really inventing solar scripture, he's inventing the most popular use of it. And uh, we say uh, it was probably ghost written by uh, to, uh, between um, St. Thomas More and St. Uh, John Fisher with some input from the king, but Henry VIII when he was very much in, in uh, a communion with Rome wrote a refutation of Luther's Babylonian captivity and uh, Actually, it, it's very, very good. Actually, you can get it. Um, you can get get its orders. In fact, you can get a translation of it now today. It's worth reading. It really rips apart the Babylonian captivity, uh, and uh, it's a fantastic uh, book. We're going on to authority and to understand and you know, appreciate what the Eucharist is. Whose side do we go on? Do we believe what the Church has always believed, or do we believe Luther? And that's the point. Uh, Eck, Johann Eck at Leipzig, uh, academic, one of the first to really engage with Luther uh, uh, um, in, in Germany. He makes this point, is everyone wrong but you? And, and Charles V uh, then, uh, at the Diet of uh, Worms in uh, 1521, he makes the point, you know, a free, you've got a single friar and you've got the whole of Christianity. And again, um, but, but Luther's idea of mistrusting any kind of authority apart from personal experience, as I said before, is pure nominalism. It's pure Occam. The response then, the Catholic Counter-Reformation, which was what ended up being after Trent, was led, um, the initial response was led by Tommaso Cajetan, an Italian um, cardinal and uh, very much an Aristotelian Thomist, from a, a follower of Aquinas, um, which is very much my own, um, to, to my own background, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I'm not gonna read through all of this, but he just reinforces why Luther is wrong and that the church isn't going to change its teaching. Sorry, um, Luther, you've raised your points. This is why we think your points are wrong. It's not an acceptance, he's got a fair point. Luther did have a fair point on the abuses of indulgences in some cases and, and various other things, but he did not have a point on the Eucharist. We just do not accept that as, as Catholic Christians. Um, his, his arguments to me are fundamentally unpersuasive. And the, the principles that he's used, once we see how they've panned out, they, they look good on paper, but we apply them in practice and to my point of view, and you know the church's, um, the counter-reformation point of view, they just don't work, um, especially his, his approach to authority, sola scripture. Um, but but we, we see here from all the reformers, once we've detached the authority from the church of interpreting scripture on the Eucharist, it's not, there's not a unanimity of uh, everybody now agrees with Luther. In fact, very few people then agreed with Luther. He found amongst... 
all of the major reformers, most of them rejected consubstantiation. And so you had a wide uh, amount of variety, which to a Catholic is unconceivable. And even in the 21st century, was, uh, somebody like myself was looking at this and go, well, that's clearly the problem with Sola Scriptura. A everything from Luther and Melanchthon, which was Luther's real successor, and to Calvin and um, Bucer, who came to England, and he was uh, very much interacted with uh, Cranmer, and um, uh, again, his, his, his works and some of his letters are, um, uh, are, are available to read. And then, uh, but they had a kind of halfway between um, complete symbolism and uh, Luther's consubstantiation, but they, they didn't accept either. They accepted some kind of real presence, but not e either of those positions. But the most extreme was really Zwingli, and uh, he really went all the way. It was um, pure uh, Berengarianism, really, where, where there's <clears throat> the, the Eucharist is just a spiritual symbol. It's, there's nothing um, ontological about it. There's an, it's not a matter of, of being. It's not an, a matter of essence. It's just a spiritual presence. And it's there during when it's needed, and then it goes. So after the, uh, the liturgy, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's not. It's just bread and wine. The receiver, the person receiving communion, for those who believe it, it is the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ. For somebody who doesn't, it isn't, and so they don't receive it in substance at all. And so that was actually the the view that eventually uh, went on to um, really uh, inform Thomas Cranmer's view, the the English um, uh, reform, uh, reformer and Archbishop of Canterbury at the time. And again, another example of Sola Scriptura, and, and this is the problem with Sola Scriptura. Luther was holding to, this is my body, and this is my blood, as a literal interpretation. Zwingli was saying it was a metaphor. Who's right? It's the same scripture. Was one of them listening to the Holy Spirit, the other one wasn't? Um, and this is the thing, without, I, I personally, I do not believe that Christ would have designed the authority of the church in such a way that such an important matter would be a matter of private interpretation. Let's uh, go on to then the English and, uh, by extension, the Welsh Reformation after the laws in Wales Acts, in which Wales essentially became part of England and was governed by um, its laws and whatever changes then were uh, enacted in England would be enacted in Wales. The, the main driver uh, of the Reformation in England and Wales was Cranmer. You had people like William Barlow, uh, who was uh, made uh, a Bishop of St. David's and uh, ultimately uh, Bath and Wells and, and what have you, um, and Ridley and Latimer and what have you. But Cranmer, being Archbishop of Canterbury, was a real driving force. He was the real mind behind the English Reformation. And so to understand what's going on in the English Reformation, we need to get into that mind, which is actually quite easy to do. Because as uh, Luther did with his Babylonian captivity, Cranmer spilled his entire thesis in his uh, book, uh, Defense of uh, the True Catholic Faith and, and Do Doctrine, in which he very clearly lays out his stall again. Uh, he's a Zwinglian. Uh, is, that's his view of of, um, of the Eucharist. There's no doubt about it. It's, he's not uh, holding to consubstantiation. There isn't any real substantial idea of a presence at all. It's pure spiritual presence. He can't see how Christ can be in heaven and on earth at the same time. And again, seems to be um, impacted by nominalism, which he, he, he would have been immersed at at Cambridge. Uh, again, absolute denial that the, the Mass of the Eucharist is a sacrifice. There's no doubt that that's what Cranmer thought. He says so himself. He can't make it clearer. So that's, that's what we're working with. That, that's the, the, um, the principle. So we're not being unfair on Cranmer. We're not being unfair on the reformers of that day. That is what they themselves say that they believe. And Cranmer's real emphasis, if there's anything sacrificial in the Eucharist, it's a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Well, the sacrifice that we're talking about uh, in the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Christ on the altar. It requires a priest, it requires an altar, it requires a victim. 
the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving is a component in the, the Catholic um, theology of the Eucharist, but it's not the predominant one, and it's united with the sacrifice of Christ. Um, you don't need an altar to sacrifice praise and thanksgiving. And that's funny. If we're talking about the Catholic idea of sacrifice, do you need a priest? Do you need an altar? Do you need a victim? Sacrifice and praise and thanksgiving does not need a ministerial priest. It does not need an altar. And the victim is the offerer, but that could be any of the, the lay faithful, the, the part of the priesthood of the lay faithful. But the, the church absolutely recognizes a priesthood of all the baptized, but that is different in essence and not only in degree from the ministerial priesthood. And we, we see this interaction in the Roman canon, in our own Catholic mass, um, that, that they, the people offer sacrifice um, for themselves, but it's united through the priest with the sacrifice of Christ. So we can see these two different points of view. Reformed view for everybody offers uh, their own uh, sacrifice and praise and thanksgiving, and the people offer it through the priest. And this especially reinforced to the most up-to-date documents, really the Second Vatican Council, um, there's, uh, and John Paul II's uh, document, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, um, which is, it's, it shows a, a beautiful interaction there. But even if there is nobody present apart from the priest in saying Mass, a private Mass, private Masses do not require a congregation. They're not ideal, but if a priest needs to say Mass, the Mass is not invalid just because there's no congregation. He offers it for the intention and receives the Eucharist and consummates the sacrifice on behalf of the people as a member of the body of Christ. But he offers it in the person of Christ, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the priest, um, the, the altar and the victim are essentially Christ, but the priest lends his hands uh, to Christ in, in offering uh, that sacrifice on behalf of the church. So the faithful, real participation is not going onto the sanctuary and doing something. It's, that's a clericalization of the laity and it's not what the church says at all, even though that became the whole, the real approach, the interpretation of pa participation of the lay faithful after the Second Vatican Council essentially didn't read the documents and just uh, went ahead and interpreted it as everybody's got to be doing something. No, it is a spiritual participation where we respond and are part, uh, connected to the, the sacrificial actions uh, uh, on the liturgy, uh, in, of the liturgy. Also, uh, by getting rid of beauty in our churches, and which is something, again, that happened in, in the 60s and 70s, and replacing with it with concrete and, um, and grey, and just getting rid of colour and, and paintings, and is very much a brutalist, um, uh, sort of architectural uh, concept, we're then losing those visual reminders that the Mass is a participation in a heavenly reality. It's not just us, we are joining in with the heavenly liturgy and it is a preparation and a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy. Because if our own, only understanding of liturgy is that it's the very bare minimum, it's kept as simple as possible, and we don't do anything more than we absolutely have to, then that's not a preparation for heaven, because we're going to have a nasty shock, quite frankly. But uh, returning to the 16th century, the real uh, changes that were enacted uh, around about uh, 1548 uh, onwards, uh, the architecture of the church it gives us an insight into what's going on with the theology of, uh, of the liturgical celebrations. So every pre-Reformation church in England and Wales would have been built in order to offer sacrifice. It's, that's the whole point. It would, it would have been built um, in the, the shape of the temple where you would have had a sanctuary, a, a temple in Jerusalem, we would have had a sanctuary and a nave, a representation of our journey through life, which was Eastern orientated. All pre-Reformation pre churches pretty much in um, this part of Europe are Eastern orientated um, and the high altar then facing east and the priest would face east with the people. So the priest would uh, offer the sacrifice facing east on behalf of the people. And yes, it is true in the Middle Ages that the balance was slightly wrong in terms of the, the participation and the ability for people to see what was actually um, uh, going on. But what 
happened under the directive which Cranmer was undoubtedly um, largely behind. Uh, the churches from 1548 onwards, the altars were smashed and a, a lot of them were actually, uh, well some of them at least, were put under the doors of the church to be trampled on and the sacrificial vestments of the priests eventually are replaced by a stole and a, and a surplice and a communion table, a wooden communion table replaced the altar. As I say, three components of, of sacrifice, priest, altar and victim. You get rid of the altar, you place it with a communion table, you, what you're saying is that the mass isn't a sacrifice, it's a meal. That's the fundamental point of it. And you're replacing then a sacrificing priest with a minister. And there's no victim. It's just the prayer of praise and thanksgiving. There's no victim uh, that is represented. Um, we see that the 16th century church is a great example in the St. Agnes Museum, of course, St. Tylos. Um, but this is a bit of a, re a representation. The, the people would have been separated by, by sex, actually, um, uh, male and females on different sides. Uh, there would have been in the 14th to 15th century onwards, uh, the later me medieval period, uh, it, was, it was fashionable to have a rood screen, which firstly reminded us of the, the veil of the temple, separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. But also there was um, a devotion to the suffering saviour. The, the, the rood is an Anglo-Saxon word for cross, so it emphasises the, the scene of the crucifixion again to remind us that the Mass is a representation of that sacrifice. So statue of St. John, statue of Mary, um, and that was all accessible. The lights, the candles on that were accessible from a rood loft, and that was uh, the, the standard. The rood screens were taken out uh, by the reformers. As I say, the altars were, were taken out. Any um, wall paintings or anything like that, which were catechetical, painted over. And one thing even now today which really um, marks out a, a, a Catholic, the Catholic understanding, is there a crucifix on or near the altar? Um, even though some reformed um, denominations now are returning to a crucifix, it's especially the Lutherans who don't absolutely reject a sacrificial understanding, they're returning to have um, a crucifix a, a, with a corpus on it. Um, the reason why we have a corpus is that uh, it's, it's a reminder that Mass is a sacrifice and the, it's not just a sacrifice, it's that sacrifice. If you lose that corpus, and you see churches sometimes a reformed tradition with just a plain cross on the altar, and they call it an altar as well, which is inconsistent with um, some theology, that's a sign that the Catholic idea, the understanding is, is missing. Again, another reinforcement of the mind of the, the reformers, John Hooper, the vestment controversy. The main reformers uh, who were behind the Book of Common Prayer had absolutely no uh, su support for the Catholic uh, sacrificial theology of the Eucharist or the real presence. Um, it's just by these, these fruits of their, their works and what they did, we can see what's going on in their, their brains. Um, incense also a um, very important part. Why we have incense? Again, 20th century, for some reason, incense um, started not to be deployed uh, very often. But if you remove incense from the Mass, what you do is you, and of course the Mass doesn't have to have incense all the time, of course it doesn't. But if you're never going to have incense, what you're doing is weakening the sacrificial link there with it. incense is linked to sacrifice so if you're going to have mass with and never have incense then it weakens the sacrificial symbols if you like uh, of the mass and it makes it much clearer it, the balance t starts to tip into the meal when the mass is a sacrifice and a meal it's not just a meal and it's not just a sacrifice it's both together and if you start playing with the symbols and removing things, an incense is really important to keep in the Mass. And it's been used for thousands of years. And, and why now it's suddenly become an issue makes very little sense. And it's nothing to do with paganism. Uh, the Church brought it in really in the 4th century when it was, it was sure of itself. It had more confidence in its own identity in respect to, to paganism. But it's Jewish. It's absolutely Jewish. 
the vestments, everything that uh, the reformers said were you know, accused of being pagan uh, interpolations into Catholic practice. It's all Jewish. It's just reinforcing our Jewish roots and our Jewish understanding of what the Eucharist is. That's all it is. And we go on then to the Book of Common Prayer. Um, the original one um, was brought in uh, 1549 and then there was a revision in 1552. Again, a lot of it's based on various different existing Catholic liturgies, um, not just the Roman Rite, but, uh, uh, but, but things have been uh, shifted about and the emphasis has been put on certain things and certain words have been removed. So there's an explanation of, of what Europe looked like in terms of its, its practice of the Missal. The Roman Rite was quite um, uh, predominant and it made its way across a lot of Europe. You had older rites as well. You had uh, in Spain and uh, the Gallican Rite uh, in France. Uh, they're completely separate actually. Although eventually in France the Gallican Rite was, uh, was replaced by the Roman Rite. But uh, the Roman Rite made its way across the Alps all the way through northern France and uh, eventually with the Normans um, to, to Salisbury. It, it, it probably didn't replace an Anglo-Saxon Rite. What was being used before was very likely a derivation of the Roman Rite anyway. But it standardised um, to a particular Norman uh, Rite, uh, Salisbury, but you also had other types in, in York and Bangor and Hereford and what have you. But they all, all they were was the Roman rites with some little changes. But the Serum rite at Salisbury was uh, standardised uh, in 1542 by Henry VIII, that was after his break with Rome, as the, the right to be used across the entire kingdom. But as I say, by that time it was still very much the Roman rite with a few tweaks. And very much uh, Henry was still died a Catholic in his Eucharistic theology at least. Um, the Roman Rite was very much, uh, the, the Catholic um, theology of the Mass, we are offering ourselves up to God and God comes up, uh, down to us. Uh, the, the highlight uh, of the Mass is the consecration. So there's this, uh, I'll go into it uh, later on, but there's this modern theory that the, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist are, are of equal importance. I don't, well, I do know where that comes from. It comes from Skillebex, a, a, a theologian of the 20th century. The teaching of the church and teaching, uh, a teaching of Edward Skillebex are not quite the same thing. But although this is really permeated into modern understanding and even into catechesis, it's not what the church teaches. This is what the church uh, teaches that the, 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 the pinnacle, the height of the Christian life is the Mass, but the, the pinnacle of the Mass is the consecration. The presence of Christ in the Eucharist is nothing like the presence of Christ in the other aspects of, of, of the people, the priest, and the, uh, and the Word of God. There is no comparison. In none of those other aspects does the substantial presence of Christ uh, come into uh, effect. The um, Serum Missal, just have a look then, a comparison between uh, the Serum Rite and the, uh, the 1552 Book of Common Prayer, which was revised because Cranmer actually thought it was too Catholic, and even Stephen Gardiner, the, the, bishop, the Catholic Bishop of Winchester, who was in prison at the time, said, I can actually accept this, which uh, which proved actually that it, it um, for Cranmer's purposes it needed to um, remove even more of the Catholic theology. But there's no doubt that Cranmer, uh, from his letters and his communications to Martin Bucer, we know that what Cranmer was doing was not a simplification but a surgical removal of sacrificial theology from that, uh, from the, 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 the prayer book. In the Roman Rite there's clear sacrificial language there. Uh, and uh, the language of victim, uh, Melchizedek, and all of that is gone in the 1552 uh, Book of God, Common Prayer. And specifically then, this was called the Black Rubric because it was printed in black rather than red. It makes it very clear this is exact, This is pure Cranmer. This comes straight from his, his book, uh, that uh, Christ isn't uh, in heaven and on the altar at the same time. Um, uh, Aquinas answered this criticism um, you know, th three centuries beforehand. Uh, but again, I think it's a reflection of um, Cranmer's nominalism. He just cannot see the, this idea. Um, uh, uh, he sees everything in concrete particulars. And if Christ is up, up in 
heaven he can't be on the altar we can't certainly can't be on multiple altars at the same time um but yeah as i say aquinas answered that uh, he, he is uh, he's not locally present he doesn't leave heaven to be present uh, on the altars of earth the, the church has always said this another little key to interpreting the motives and, and what's actually happening here is to examine the process by which the 1549 prayer book was put into um action as it were and there were various and there's a commission at windsor and then uh, a vote in the house of lords and we've got the surviving transcripts of some of it and we we know the, the positions of a lot of the bishops uh, we can put them into camps into a, a catholic camp even though they were separate from rome by that and they acquiesced in um, the act of uh, supremacy they still retained a, 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 a catholic uh, uh, idea of the Eucharist and we know the reformers we know what they thought so we can very clearly put them into different uh, camps here and to some of it we can summarize uh, some of their um, their interactions and some of their comments in the uh, the, the House of Lords debate on the prayer book and, and specifically uh, the nature of the Eucharist in fact we can see the, the votes so by and large with some exceptions by and large the, the reform minded bishops voted for the Book of Common Prayer and by and large the Catholic-minded bishops voted against it and um, Stephen Gardner as I said was already in uh, in prison and the Book of Common Prayer wasn't popular it, it, uh, it caused a revolt in, uh, in, in Cornwall and the, uh, the, the west of England and of course the Prayer Book Rebellion. It's again a reminder that reform was enforced from London. It wasn't a, a grassroots uh, movement. It was forced by the Crown and uh, after the Pilgrimage of Grace, for example, the, the, the uh, Crayer Book Rebellion was the last attempt really at trying to stop the Reformation on behalf of the people. Of England and Wales, essentially, well, particularly England. When Edward uh, the Sixth died, and uh, Queen Mary became uh, queen and uh, replaced Cranmer pretty much immediately with Cardinal Poole, not Cardinal Pole, by the way. His name is actually pronounced Poole. Um, he, he essentially uh, he did actually try to save Cranmer. That Ma Mary. Uh, had a, a personal vendetta against Cranmer. But firstly, it's interesting to see what was the reaction to Catholics when we restored the Missal, restored Catholic practice in England. What did the Catholics of the time think about the last few years when the Book of Common Prayer and, and Reformed theology had been prominent? And Poole made it very clear with the the new ordinal and with the uh, the Book of Common Prayer that the Eucharist. Uh, had um, had not been confected and again it's this taking away the sacrificial essence of the priesthood which is the heart of Leo the 13th uh, objection. It's interesting because we do have um, a large amount of uh, Poole's surviving letters and he, he accuses uh, Cranmer of essentially following Beringer but at least he said that Beringer recanted. 39 articles again if we're going to try to interpret the 39 article, articles which came in mostly Cranmer's work even posthumously because they came in much uh, after the accession of Elizabeth I but it's, it's mostly um, Cranmer's posthumous work in the 39 articles and we, we need to interpret them in the context of what Cranmer actually thought but any attempt to interpret them in a Catholic way, as um, St. John Henry Newman did in Tract 90, is, and the criticism at the time was trying to make them seem to say the opposite of what they actually do. And, and that, that's it. Um, 39 articles are fundamentally Protestant. A Catholic response with the Council of Trent. All it did, the Council, was just reaffirm. Um, what we've already said, what Catholic doctrine is, um, defended the sacrifice of the Mass, defended um, the, the offering of intentions, defended the real presence. And what it did with all of these different prayer books coming out in Europe with Zwingli and Luther and, and uh, Cranmer and, and what have you, in Catholic territories then, um, Pope St. Pius V then standardised the Roman Rite across um, all of Europe.
a Eucharist in the modern period, just to go, uh, to go to show, we still, even in the 20th century, haven't changed our doctrine. Mediata Dei, Pope Pius XII, it's a fantastic document, full of good, solid, unambiguous, clear, orthodox, sacrificial, sacramental theology. Um, also defending it against the, the, the faith against some novel doctrines that had come in during the 20th century. Um, and there's, we, we'll, we'll pa um, pass by them very quickly, really, but they belong to the um, discussion on substance. Uh, the priests acting the person of Christ, Second Vatican Council, again, it's all one continuity of doctrine. But you get um, 20th century theologians who uh, have denied um, uh, the, the special presence, really, uh, of Christ in the Eucharist and tried, because they don't believe in substance, have tried to um, find some other way of reconciling transubstantiation with modern science or whatever. And a denial of substance, really, uh, we cannot understand the Eucharist if we're using modern philosophy to uh, define what we mean by substance. If we keep to um, the traditional idea of substance, which doesn't rely on Aristotle, but Aristotle, as I say, gives a, a very useful structure to understanding what we mean. Uh, as long as we, we stay by that and, and don't go off and try to redefine things, then we'll generally have a good, solid, orthodox understanding of the Eucharist and the, uh, the, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist in contrast with the presence of Christ in, in other things. But that I'll leave, things like transfinalization and um, transsignification. It's all because um, people like Rana and Skillebex have stopped accepting the traditional notion of substance. And they're trying to find a way of still, especially Rana, still trying to find a way of reconciling um, Orthodox Catholic doctrine with what he sees as a philosophical movement away from traditional Aristotelian metaphysics, which isn't possible. You, you end up doing that. You'll have a, a dead end. So transfinalization is a, this a theory that the, the, the purpose of the bread and wine have changed because there's no such thing as substance. And uh, transsignification, um, again, it's a sign, a change of sign. Trying to remove Eucharistic theology from ontology, from an understanding of being, to an interpretation of the uh, of the mind. Essentially, that, that's it. And it was condemned by Pope Paul VI um, in 1965. So I'll um, I'll leave that there. Bibliography, further reading. But uh, yeah, if you want to go into some of these depths in, and these subjects in more depth. Um, you know, this, there's resources for you to do so, but also um, the the parallel video doing on substance then will um, explain some of the philo philosophy behind it. But it, it's high level stuff, so um, not expecting you to sail through it. it it'll you know, you, you'll need to stop and start and read, uh, do a bit of reading um, on, on some of these subjects to start to. To make some sense but it, it's so much more it, it's it's richer and deeper than um, just stopping at a sort of primary school level saying that this is what we believe because we believe it um, so, and we need to be able to defend it against uh, the objections of um, people like Richard Dawkins who don't actually understand what they're talking about when they talk about substance so uh, hope it was some use anyway and um, uh, we'll look forward to providing some more um, uh, output in uh, the near future.